Yeah. Am I on now? Yeah. All right. Let the church say amen, amen to the reading of the word. All right. Let me see. Hey, when he read that, I was wondering if we were going to have some folk get up and leave. I was hoping y'all would stay today. So um, my name is Marcus Clark. To those of you who are with us for the very first time, um, I'm one of the elders here at the factory. PK is enjoying a little bit of time away. Uh, he will be back with us very soon, but he has been enjoying some focused Lucille time. You know, that's what he enjoys. He wants to spend some time with Lucille. So, but he will be back here really soon. He misses you guys, loves you all. Um, and, and if you're here with us for the first time, please uh, hear me when I say welcome. So grateful that you're here with us today. We're continuing in, in the series that we've entitled Fruit. It's a series we've called Fruit. We've been looking at the book of Galatians chapter five, where Paul lays out the fruit of the spirit, what he calls the fruit of the spirit. And in Galatians chapter five, verses 22 and 23, Paul says the fruit of the spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against those things, there's no law. So we're in like the fifth week of this series where we're walking through looking at the fruit of the spirit. Now, Jesus, we're in Luke chapter six today, but in uh, chapter six, verse 44, Jesus says, you will know a, tr a tree by its fruit. You'll know what kind of tree it is by the fruit it bears. So as we've been looking at the fruit of the spirit in this series, we've been asking ourselves this question, what kind of tree am I? What kind of tree am I? Am, am I a tree? If you're going to know a tree by its fruit, then, then what kind of fruit am I displaying to letting the world know what kind of tree I am? Am I a tree that displays the fruit of a disciple of Jesus? Or am I displaying some other kind of fruit? What Paul also talks about in Galatians 5, the, the works of the flesh. So, so we've been asking ourselves that question. We're walking through each one of these, these qualities, these characteristics of a disciple of Jesus. So as we look at where we're going today, I was thinking about this. There's an author and a podcaster that I, I admire greatly. His name is Sky Jatani. And, and a couple years ago, Sky published a book and the title of the book was What If Jesus Was Serious? What If Jesus Was Serious? It's a real easy read, um, although it was a challenging book and, and I would recommend that. You could call that your homework. Go get the book, read the book. It's a great book. Um, I recommend it to adults and, and kids. He uses doodles to explain the concepts. But what he did in that book, what if Jesus was serious? He walked verse by verse through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. And if you remember a couple years ago, uh, right before the pandemic, we, we went through a series called This Is Us, where we went through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, and went verse by verse through that over the course of about six months. So when we were finishing that series, that's when that book was released. So I was really interested to read the book and, and, and see how it was that he treated those, those uh, texts. And, and I really enjoyed it. And like I said, I would, I would encourage you to read it. And, and the essential premise of the book, he, he talks about in the introduction, the reason he felt like he needed to write it. He tells a story where he's beginning to, he was going to teach a, a class, a Sunday school class at his church. And they were going to go through the sermon on the Mount. So what he decided to do in the first class is let's read these verses together. Let's read Matthew chapter five, chapter six and chapter seven together. So that's what they did. They sat there as a class and they read those three chapters. And when he was done reading, he asked a simple question of the, of the class. He asked this question. He said, how many of you think that Jesus expects us to live out these commands? Nobody in the class raised their hand. Nobody. He dug a little deeper and, and started asking questions. And, and what he got was a number of responses. He got a number of excuses from the class. And, and what he concluded was essentially, as a whole, what we've done is we've made a decision. We've decided that we don't need to take Jesus' words seriously. So he saw the need that he... He, write, he needed to write the book and he asked this question. It's a good question. It's a simple question. You might even think it's an obvious question, but here's the question. What if when Jesus said what he said, he meant what he said? What if when Jesus said the things he says in scripture that are recorded for us, what if he was serious? What if Jesus actually meant the stuff 
that he said. If you go back to the text in Matthew, and then particularly if you were to go back and, and watch the, the last sermon we did during the series, This Is Us, and, and I'd encourage you to do so if for no other reason than the fact that I preached it. But Jesus gives an illustration in that, in that text at the end of chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. He talks about two kinds of builders, one who builds his house on rock and another who builds his house on sand. And, and when the storm comes, the, the one who's built his house on the rock, his, his house is secure. But the one who built his house on the sand, his house is going to fall. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come down. And what he says is, what you do with my words, if you, if you hear these words of mine and you do what I say, you're building your house on a rock. And if you hear what I'm saying and you disregard it, you throw it away, you don't do what it is that I'm saying, then you're building your house on sand. What he's saying is your eternal security rests on what you do with my word. So the, so the point is, the point Jesus is making is his words. What we do with his words is the difference, as I said it at the time, between life and death. It's, it's what happens in terms of our eternal security. What are we doing with what Jesus said? So today, I'll give you one guess what I'm talking about today. One guess. Y'all can't look at my shirt. We're talking about kindness today. We're talking about kindness today. And I don't want to get, I'm not going to get into um, issues of the day. I know we've all got these things, it's just stuff going on around us right now. I'm not going to address the issues that are happening in our world right now, but, but what I can say at this moment, what I've seen with my own eyes and heard with my own ears is that kindness is something that's in critically short supply right now. Especially from Christians. We are some of the least kind people that I see operating right now. Critically short supply. So, so what we're looking at today, the text Alex read, at least a part of it, we're not going to go through all of it, but we're, we're going to be specifically looking at chapter 6, verses 27 to 36 of the book of Luke. And then in our current time, in the current cultural context that we're in right now, Jesus' words about kindness, they may sound outlandish. They might sound impractical. They, they may sound unrealistic. They might sound virtually impossible. But here's the question. What if Jesus meant what he said? What if Jesus was serious about what he said about kindness? What if Jesus meant what he said? If we're going to be actual disciples, real disciples, people who, what's a disciple? A learner. A follower, someone who learns from Jesus, follows Jesus. And we're going to take Jesus at his actual words. Now, now we oftentimes say that's what we do. We say we're people who are Bible believing. But when it comes to actually doing the actual words of Jesus, we, we oftentimes, not just mindlessly, we mindfully, willfully refuse to do what Jesus said we should do. So, so if we're going to be disciples, what does it actually mean in the area of how we treat one another? How we, how we love our neighbors. Here, hey, check this out. How we love our enemies. What if Jesus was serious about that? So here's, here's where we're going today. Let's just get the doors. If y'all ain't left yet, I got a feeling y'all might stay for the whole thing. That's good. As disciples of Jesus... We are called to radical, unreasonable kindness. Radical, unreasonable kindness. Let's pray. Father, uh, I'm, gonna, um, I'm just going to stand on your word. Uh, there's nothing else I can do at this moment. I, I hide myself behind that. I hide myself behind your word. I hide myself behind your cross. I can't, I can't do this. Unless the Holy Spirit anoints me, enables me, and empowers me to do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to beg you to increase while I decrease. Get me out of the way. Do what I can't do. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 So I ain't looking for a whole bunch of amens. It's okay. I know what I'm dealing with. So let's just, let's just, keep, let's just keep moving. All right. So today we're in Luke chapter 6, 
verses 27 to 36. I want you to go there in your Bibles, on your phones, whatever it is. Um, if you pull your phone out to look at the scripture, please just stay on the Bible app. Don't, don't go nowhere else. Y'all with me? Because I know how you do. Y'all got ADHD just like the rest of us. Ooh, look at that, a notification. And you jump over to that, and then they say, you know, I've lost you. No, stay with me. I'm not going to be before you very long. So we're in Luke chapter 6, uh, and around verse 27, this is a portion of what we're, what's known as Jesus' Sermon on the Plain or Sermon on the Plateau. And, and what this is, essentially, this is Luke's perspective of the same, some of the same teaching that Jesus uh, does in Matthew that we know of as the Sermon on the Mount. It's basically the same information, but Luke, this is Luke telling it from his perspective. It's him structuring this information according to the way that he determined it was best for his audience. So Jesus is here. Jesus is on the plane and he's teaching his disciples and he's instructing them in what it means to follow him. He's talking about, hey, this is us. This is who we are as Jesus followers. And he gets to this place where he starts to talk about how it is his disciples are to respond to those people who are against them and, and those who are adversarial to them and their mission and Jesus and his mission. And what Jesus does is he lays out some, what I'm thinking of as considerations. These are things we should consider, things we should consider about how it is that a disciple is supposed to display kindness, especially in the face of difficult circumstances. I want you to consider these things, then I want you to act on them. Consider them, and then act. So the first thing, the first thing we see here, starting at verse 27, is consider the source. Consider the source. Now, the verses leading up to this, just a little bit of background, just kind of leading into these, these verses, starting at 27. But in the preceding verses, and Alex read them, Jesus pronounces blessings and woes on different groups. Okay, so in verses 20 to 23, what we see is a condensed version, Luke's condensed version of what we know as the Beatitudes, right? So Jesus pronounces blessings on these uh, groups of people that would be considered the misfortunate, the poor, the hungry, the sad, those who are hated in society. He says, hey, you guys should be glad because your reward is great in heaven. Those are the people we would see on the margins. He says, you're the people who should be glad. You're the people who are blessed by God. Your reward will be great. Then in verses 24 to 26, he turns his attention to those who are more favored in society. He talks to the rich, the full, those who are laughing now, those who are accepted now. To that group, he says, whoa, whoa. He says, basically, if you're going to find your ultimate reward, if you find your ultimate value in acceptance, and success and prosperity here, then you've gotten what it is you want. And that's all you're going to get. So woe to you because you've already received your reward. What Jesus is doing in these verses, he's laying down a dividing line. I need you to understand this. He's laying down a dividing line. He's already made it clear what he's saying here is going to be against the grain. It's not going to be what we would typically expect. I'm, I'm, I'm doing something a little different. I'm trying to teach you a different way to live as a disciple of Jesus, even in the way you serve and worship God. So in verse 27, he moves into this section that we're talking about today, he addresses kindness. And he says this, consider the source. Verse 27, he says this, but I say to you who hear, I'm stop there, let's stop there. Jesus essentially says, and I just want to, I want to make sure we get this, just in this little section, I say to you who hear, this is important, Jesus basically says this, before I go any further, some of y'all are going to hear this, some of you aren't. Some of you are going to really listen to what it is that I'm saying, some of you won't. Some of you are going to listen intently with the intention to obey. Some of y'all just casually listening. You're, you're just on the outside. You're on the outskirts. You're just kind of catching what it is I'm saying, but you have no intention of actually listening and hearing and obeying and applying it to your life. But he says this, if you've made a decision that you're going to be my disciple, if you're really going to listen to me, if you're really going to listen to my words, if you're really going to obey what I'm saying, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. What I'm about to say to those of you who hear, what I'm about to say is only for the serious and only for those who take me seriously. 
I, I, I'm saying it to you because you're interested in hearing it. I, I know I'm belaboring this a little bit, but Jesus says this, just in this one little section, I'm saying this to you who hear. I'm saying it to those of you who are actually listening to me. So, so there's two questions. Just in this one clause, there's two questions that are raised in my mind. Here's the first question. Who are you listening to? Who, who's your source? Consider, consider your source. Who is it that you're being discipled by? Who are we being discipled by? Man, Rod's here. Rod's a pastor. I hear pastors say all the time, man, I get an hour and a half a week with these people. But, 20, but six days and 22 and a half hours of the rest of the week, they're being discipled by CNN and Fox and MSNBC. That's who's discipling us. Here's the question. Who are you listening to? Are you, are you being discipled by cable news? Are you being discipled by podcasts? Are you being discipled by talking heads on TV and opinion columnists and social media influencers? Are you being discipled by them? Or are you listening to Jesus? Are you actually spending time sitting in this? Not, not, not just picking it up like a devotional grab bag to get a verse or two, but actually like studying this word and asking God and listening intently in prayer saying, God, speak to me. Change my heart by your word. Whatever it is you got to say, I'm listening. Who are you, who are you listening to? Who are we, we have to ask ourselves that question. Consider your sources. Because Jesus said, I'm only talking to those who are serious. And the second question is this. If you say you're listening, if you say you're listening to Jesus, if you say you're following Jesus, if you say you're a disciple of Jesus, are you actually listening with the intent of hearing to obey or are you just listening casually? Are you just cool with being a part of the experience? Are you looking for Jesus' hands and not his heart? Are you coming into the church building, wherever you might go, wherever you might be watching online, and just, just to say, I got it in this week? Or do you really want to hear from God and really do what he says? Do you really want to be a disciple of Jesus? Here's the thing, guys. You're going to be somebody's disciple. You're going you're gonna to be a disciple and you're going to make disciples. Yes. Whose disciple do you want to be and whose disciple do you want to make? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Are we just hanging on the edges, listening casually, but being discipled elsewhere? Here's the question. Are you serious? Are you one who hears? I, I want to lay this foundation because what Jesus is about to say it's not easy to hear. So you got to make a decision up front. I want to hear what Jesus has to say. Because if you don't, yeah. then you'll just kind of brush it off and keep on going the way we've been going. We'll talk about it. Here we go. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Marcus, Marcus. Calm down. All right. All right. I calm myself down. <laughs> okay. Consider your source. Consider your source. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. Consider the sacrifice. Consider the sacrifice. So Jesus says this, if you're really listening, if you're, if you're really listening, if you really want to hear from me, if you've counted the cost and you've made a determination that you want to be in on this life of a disciple, it's going to get real. It's about to get real. It's going to cost you something. Matter of fact, matter of fact, it's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you everything. Let's look at this together. Luke chapter 6, we're going to start at verse 27 again. But I say to you who hear, those of you who are listening, you're serious about this thing, here we go. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. Whoa! Verse 29, to him who strikes you on the one cheek off of the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I want to look at this. I want to look at this, and I want to be intentional about the way we look at this. I want us to break these down and look at these verses very intentionally. Okay, stay with me. So in verses 27 to 28, what Jesus does is he addresses the emotional aspects 
of adversarial relationships. He's, he, he, does, he takes more of an inside look. This is about relationships internal, the emotional side of them. Then in verses 29 to 30, he turns a little bit and he starts to talk about the physical aspects of these relationships and interaction, what goes on in our bodies and with our stuff. So what I want to do is I want to look, we're going to put this this stuff on the screen and it's going to be up here for a minute because I really want us to, to look at these and take them in intentionally. What I need you to do, I need you to take off your church hat. Y'all, I know y'all in church people watching online, you, you, you tuned in to church. But what I need you to do, I need you to remove yourself from church. We're going to look at these relational impacts, these relational descriptors, things that could be potentially done to someone, four of them emotional, four of them physical. And what I want to do is I want to look at them independent first of how Jesus instructs us to respond. Okay, you with me? Take off your church hat. Y'all stop being holy for just a second. I need, I need a little more hood, a little less holy, just for a minute, all right? <laughs> just for a second. Okay, we're going to turn that back on, though. Don't, don't throw the holy away and go full hood. Just put your, put your holy to the side and pull the hood out just for a high second. Okay, here we go. So if I asked you, just based on the way you've been wired, just based on the way you've been taught, by your cultural environment, your upbringing. Uh, uh, John Walton, Professor John Walton, he, he talks about a cultural river. It's, it's basically, the culture is like a river and it just flows along and we kind of ride along and bathe in the waters of our culture. So just based on your cultural river, where you find yourself, how do you feel you would respond to being treated in the way that Jesus lays out here? So let's look at this. I just want to look at these first. All right, the first thing is this. Someone identifies themselves as your enemy. They say to you, I'm your enemy. They identify themselves as your enemy. Or someone identifies themselves as hating you. You know for a fact they're your enemy. They hate you. Take your church hat off for just a second. Somebody curses you or curses at you. Or they spitefully use you. What that means is they mistreat you. You've been mistreated. You've been insulted. You've been treated abusively. You've been falsely accused. That's the, that's the emotional side. Then Jesus flips to the physical side. He says this, somebody strikes you. Put the other four up. They strike you. Come on. There we go. They strike you. And, and listen, the, the word Jesus uses here for strikes, it's not what we might conceive of as just, you know, getting slapped on the face. Oh, you know, like, no. The word he uses here is it speaks of a repeated and the, the translation, the word is literally translated pummeling or, or um, thumping to be thumped or pummeled repeatedly. That's what we're talking about. Someone strikes you that way or you have something taken from you. Um, primarily, ideally, we're talking about by legal recourse. Somebody sues you, takes your stuff away from you or somebody is just always asking you for things, just asking you for stuff. Or, or even having someone pick up your personal possessions and just carry them away. It's a heck of a list, isn't it? That's a serious list. Now, 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 with your hood hat on, in a 2022 cultural view, let's just think about this for a second. How have you been trained? How have you been programmed to automatically respond to stuff like that? Those, ki- those types of aggressions, those types of transgressions. What is the standard, culturally acceptable way, even for folks in the church, to respond to being treated that way? <sighs> okay, I will address one thing. Um, over the last number of weeks, I have heard a number of prominent Christians, people who name the name of Jesus, talk about what they would call a Christian virtue of self-defense. Where you find that at? I'm serious. I'm serious. Where is that in here? But we've got people who, who say they're believers who would say to themselves and to others, we have a God-given right to protect ourselves. I don't, I don't, if you find that in scripture, email me, Marcus at thefactoryministries.org. I will chop that up with you. It's not in here. Y'all ain't nobody left yet. Okay, all right. 
But, but, but in, a, in, a, in, a, in a 2022 cultural view, how is it that we've been trained to respond to that? Just think about it for a second. You can, you can fill it in on the right for yourself. What, what, the way you would respond. And I want us to sit. I want us to sit for a second because Jesus does this purposefully. I want us to sit for a second in the egregiousness of that list. That's some egregious stuff. This isn't like Penny Annie, you know, not a big deal type treatment. This is some, this is some serious, serious mistreatment. Sit in it for just a second, just a second. How you would respond. I know y'all all, everybody got a list. They're my enemy, I'm their enemy. Hates me, I hate them. Curse you, oh, I got something for you. Like we've all, we've all gone through and, and filled in our list. Strikes me, oh buddy, haven't we? Because that's how we've been trained. That's how, that's how our, cultural, our culture teaches us, even, even in the church of God. So, now, let's take a look at the way Jesus expects us, those of us who hear him, to respond. To the emotional. You have an enemy? Love them. Love them. And not, not, not just, you know, good feelings. Jesus is talking about a deep, fervent love. This isn't a surface love. Fervent love. His kind of love. God kind of love. Agape love. Right? If someone hates you, do good to them. Do good to them. He says, you, you are to act commendably toward them. Whoa, it's quiet in here. Someone curses you with your mouth. This word, the word he uses there means to use your mouth to bless them. Verbally praise them. Celebrate them. Invoke God's blessings on them. And if someone spitefully uses you, they abuse you, they, they mistreat you, they lie on you, pray for them. Pray for them. And that's not, that's not now lay me down to sleep. Lord bless this food with the hands that prepared it. Type, no, no. Earnestly pray. Fervently pray. Intercede. Intercessory prayer. Get on your face for them. <laughs> Boy, y'all are, are looking at me with that tone of voice, and I don't like it. Um, and then to the physical. Look at the physical. If someone strikes you, offer them the other cheek. What, what Jesus is saying here, what Jesus is saying here is refuse to retaliate. Refuse to to retaliate. Uh, oh, someone takes from you. What he wants you to do is offer more than what was taken. The idea here is accept humiliation, accept loss. Accept that loss is the part, is part of the life of a disciple. Ooh, wait, I can see y'all. Y'all are with me. Y'all are with me. I feel it. I cannot wait till I'm done and get out of here because I am. Don't tackle me on the way to the door. If someone asks something from you, give to them. And don't just give what they ask. Give generously. Give over and above what it is that they've asked for. Amen. And then, if someone carries off your possessions, they take something from you, don't even ask for it back. Accept the loss. Here's the question. Here's the question. What if Jesus was serious? What if Jesus meant what he said? Now, what Jesus isn't doing, what he's not doing, he's not creating a culture, he's not creating an expectation where his followers just present themselves as doormats to be walked over and used and abused. No, it's not what he's doing. It's not what he's doing. Understand what he is doing. What Jesus is doing here, he is setting a precedent for what the heart of a disciple is to look like. That's what the heart of a disciple should be. He's painting a picture of the heart of a disciple. Okay, what am I saying? So, if we were to compare the initial thoughts, when you had, when we just had the left side there and y'all had written, uh, y'all had written in blood the stuff on the right side that, you know, that wasn't what Jesus said. But before I put, you know, the Jesus words on the right, you had stuff on the right yourself, right? This is how I'm old. This is how we get down where I'm from. But then when Jesus lays his words 
on top of that, you know, the way we would generally automatically respond to these kind of situations just because of how we've been culturally programmed, because of our cultural river versus the way Jesus expects us to, the way Jesus lays his expectations on top of it. What do we see? What we see is this. Every single thing that we have learned about confrontation, about adversarial interactions in our culture as a disciple is the opposite of the attitude and practice expected of a disciple of Jesus. Every single thing we've been taught, even in the church, if it doesn't line up with these words, about the way we love our enemies, the way we deal with our enemies, the way we deal with uh, harsh interactions, the way we deal with traffic problems, the way we deal with somebody flipping us off on 285, everything we've learned about it, we've learned it wrong. And that makes sense. It makes complete sense, and here's why. We adopt the heart position of the culture we inhabit. You're going to adopt the heart position of a culture you inhabit. What do I mean? When we, um, if we respond in ways that are pretty standard in terms of our cultural surroundings, what we do, we're just showing that we are active members of that culture. We are active inhabitants of the culture, the culture that we are a part of, the, the, the environment to which we, where we live, where we inhabit, where we make residence. That is the culture where our heart position will be aligned. Does that make sense? Here's the problem. When our, when our, when our, when our responses isn't in line with what Jesus says, we often will use the trope, well, you know, I'm, I'm only human. Um, you know, it's just, it's, I'm human. This is, this is who I am. It's, you know, I, I'm only human. But, but here's the problem. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul says this. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He is a new creature. The old is gone. It is passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So, if you're saying, well, I'm just human, that's because you're talking about the old humanity. If you've accepted the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are no longer a part of the old humanity. You are now a new creation. Jesus Christ created a new humanity. He created a new creation. We are part of that creation. We are part of that humanity. Therefore, the rules of the old creation no longer apply. The old creation is dead. The continual stance, the continual position, the heart position of someone who is a new creation in Christ is love. Jesus is setting up a, a stance, a new stance, and the stance, the heart position of someone who has accepted Jesus and is a part of the new humanity, the new creation is love. This is not the new stance. This is the old stance. This is the old stance. This, that's the old stance. That's not the new stance. This, that's where most of us are now. That's the old stance. That's not the new stance. The new stance is the stance of love. What, mm. what Jesus is doing, Jesus is doing this. He's setting, so put the list back up there for a second. Um, Jesus is setting a standard for a habitual attitude and a habitual stance of a believer. That's what your heart should look like. Now, will there be circumstances where you just got to deal with stuff and eat some things? That's where your heart, Jesus ain't saying be a doormat. Jesus ain't saying let people run all over top of you, but that's where your heart should be. And if that's where your heart is, then that's probably going to be where you respond. That's the expectation. He's setting up a standard for a habitual attitude. And what we see in these verses, we see two things about this love stance, this stance of love that Jesus is instituting here. The first thing is, you see it in verse 29, love is non-retaliatory. Love is non-retaliatory. We are not those as disciples of Jesus who need or look to get back. We don't look to take revenge. Who did God say revenge, vengeance belonged to anyway? He says it's his. He will be the one who repays, right? So the heart of a disciple is one 
that's a stance of love, and that stance is non-retaliatory. The second thing we see in verse 30, love is generous. Generous. It gives. It goes above and beyond and gives generously, consistently, continually, and it goes above and beyond what is asked. Woo! Y'all with me? That ain't my words anyway, so y'all ain't got to be with me. Is you with Jesus? <laughs> And, and, and it gives, it's generous, and it gives without regard for repayment. That's what we're going to see here in a second. The habitual stance, the standard operating disposition in the face of our enemies, in the face of adversity, in the face of mistreatment, has to be one of love. Love. Love is the currency of the new creation to which we now belong. If we are in Christ. Amen. All right. Some of y'all are with me. Okay, good, good. I thought I had lost everybody. Okay. So one, real quick, this is what I want to do. I want to talk about spirit enablement. All right, let's talk about spirit enablement for just a second. All right. So I hope that it's really clear to everyone that, because I haven't really talked about this yet, but I hope we understand that what, what we're talking about here, what Jesus is, is creating here, this is some supernatural stuff. This is supernatural stuff, and, and it's obvious. It's, I hope that it's obvious. I hope that you aren't missing this at all, that, that there's got to be, if there's going to be this kind of new creation, this new humanity living, it's only going to be possible through the indwelling and the empowerment of, our, of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and minds. Okay, that is absolutely true. It's absolutely necessary. We've got to have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I will not downplay the significance of the Holy Ghost. All right. One of the things that we can be tempted to do here is we can lay that down and say stuff like, well, you know, God knows my heart and he's just working on me. And I'm a work in progress and, you know, I won't be perfected until Jesus comes. And, and you know, like that's that's what we do. I know I cussed him out, but, you know. Jesus is working on me. He's, he's still doing a work in my heart. And the Holy Ghost knows that. And you know what? You know what? You know what? And I, like I said, I don't want to downplay it. That's absolutely true. To a point. It's absolutely true. To a point. The Holy Spirit's got to enable us to display this God kind of kindness. And for us to adopt this consistent stance of love, new creation, dynamics of where our hearts are, on a daily basis, that there, there's, we've got to have the Holy Spirit. But there is a part for us to play. I said the very part of the, the uh, beginning of this point, you've got to consider the sacrifice. Yes. There is sacrificial work that we have to do. Yes. And it is a sacrificial yes. work of our wills. Yes. Stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. It's a work of our wills that we've got to do, and we've got to do it every day. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus says this, if any man will come after me, let him what? Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You've got to make a decision that come hell or high water, come mistreatment, enemies being cursed, you're going to follow Jesus. There's some stuff that we've got to die to. There's a work in our wills that's got to happen. We've got to mindfully, willfully, intentionally commit every single day our, our context, our cultural context, our pride, our selfishness, our ego, our wills. We've got to willingly, intentionally give it up. We've got to be willing to die. We've got to be willing to die. We've got to be willing to be walking, talking, dead folks. Go because it's not possible for a dead person to be offended when mistreated. Dead people don't get mad when they're mistreated. Romans 12, Paul says this, we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. What that means is you put, your, you put yourself on the altar of the Holy Spirit every single day and you say, God, crucify my flesh, kill my ego. Kill my pride. So if I'm mistreated, but I accept it the way Jesus expects me to, then I get glory. He gets glory out of that. He gets glory out of that. What we have to do is we need to commit daily conscious acts of internal murder. 
daily conscious acts of internal murder. There's some stuff inside of you that you need to lay on the altar to be killed every day. That's the heart of this new creation dynamic that we're talking about here. That's the heart. And you know the best place to practice that? Huh? Huh? It's not at work. It's, it's, not, it's not on social media. It's in your house. The best place to practice, if you got teenagers, the best place to practice dying to your ego and your pride, if you've got a spouse, the best place to practice dying to your ego and your pride is at the house. Say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. All right. I'm talking to my kids. <laughs> Don't you shake your head. So, so we're t- I had to say something to make this lighter because good, good grief. All right. So we're talking about the fruit of the spirit of kindness. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. We consider the source, right? Who are, we, who are we being discipled by? Who are we listening to? How do we show kindness to our fellow man, even those who present themselves as our enemies? Is it Jesus or is it somebody else that we're listening to? Then we consider the sacrifice. We're going to have a heart position, a stance of love that Jesus is calling us to. It's going to require that we willingly sacrifice ourselves, our agendas, our pride, our very lives, dying every day, to the things that prevent us from living fully as those who belong to Christ. And here's the last thing. We got to consider the standard. Consider the standard. Who are we modeling ourselves after? Let's look at this. Luke chapter 6, verses 32 to 36. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. So so what Jesus is saying is this. All this stuff right here, loving those who love you, giving to those who give to you, lending to those who lend to you, doing good to those who do good to you, that's reasonable and it's expected. But reasonable and expected is not the standard. That's not... The standard. You love those who love you? Okay, cool. That's easy. Anybody can do that. You do good to people who do good stuff for you? You just give and take, you know, quid pro quo? Okay. That's, ain't no problem with that. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Anybody can do that. You lend money to someone and you expect them to give it back to you? Or at some point in the future, you think that maybe I'll be able to extract some kind of resources for myself from them? Ain't no big deal. Banks do that all the time. That's not the standard. That doesn't speak to our allegiance to Jesus. That doesn't tell the world who we belong to. Look at verse 35. He says this, but, but, but love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the most high. So the stuff that you were doing in the prior three verses when it was easy, now do it when it's hard. That that, that says something. That tells somebody something. That's an identifying marker because what he said in those prior verses to verse 27, if we have our our hearts and minds set on the things of the world, when we get those things, well, that's all you're going to get. So if you feel like doing good is only to get good, then that's all the good you're going to get. If you feel like giving in order to get is the only reason to give, then that's all you're going to get. If you feel like loving is the only reason, the only reason to love is someone loves you, is so someone can love you in return, that's all the love you're going to experience. But if you will do it when it's hard, when you're not going to get love back, when you're not going to get good things done back to you, when you're not going to get your money back, that's when you get credit. That's when you look like Jesus. That's when you look like Jesus. These are the signs. He said, these are the signs that you're a child of the most high God. You don't get credit when you do it the easy way, but when you show kindness, when you show love in the spots where it's hard, your reward, your payment 
will be eternal. See, we're not working for quid pro quo. We're working for well done. I'm working for well done. And can't none of y'all, I love you, I love you, I love you. Can't, can't none of y'all give me a well done. Can't none of y'all give me, when it really counts, on that day, the way the Bible calls that day, when that day comes, can't none of y'all do nothing for me. I'm waiting for the well done from him. That's the well done I want. So then the question becomes, we have to ask ourselves this question. Do we want eternal rewards or do we want immediate satisfaction? That's the question that's posed here in this text. Do you want eternal reward? Do you want to get a well done from him or do you want a well done? Like, I appreciate y'all. I love y'all. But I, I can't live for your approval. I can't. I got to live for an audience of one. Look at verse 35 again. He said, love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing return. Your reward will be great. And you will be the sons of the most high. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful just as your father is also merciful. That's the standard. That's the standard. Jesus is the standard. Jesus is the model. The world's going to know that we belong to him. The world's going to know that we're his children when we act like him, when we look like him, when we do things the way he does it, when we display kindness, when we display love, when it's not convenient. That's when the world's going to know that we look like Jesus. Who has displayed more kindness? Who has displayed more love when it wasn't deserved than Jesus? When Jesus, it couldn't have been easy to step down out of glory, to come here to this earth, put on flesh, live a sinless life for 33 and a half years, then die on the cross to pay, pay the penalty for our sin debt, knowing he was never going to get his money back. But he's the model. Jesus did what he's expecting us to do. Because what he did was he took your sin, and he took your sin, and he took your sin, and he took my sin, and he didn't expect anything in return. So his expectation is for us to do the same. Give with no expectation of getting it back. Because that's what he did. He's the standard. He's the model. And, and, and who showed more love? Jesus himself. When Jesus is on the cross, when Jesus is on the cross, in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, Jesus is on the cross. People are tormenting him at that moment, and he says to his father, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. In the moment that he was being crucified, he was praying for those who had hung him on the cross. That's the model. That's the standard. So here's the thing, guys. Kindness? Kindness only counts when it's hard. Kindness counts when it's hard, when it's radical, unreasonable kindness, that's when we look like Jesus. That's when we look like Jesus. That's when we know we're following our Lord. So if you want to go off, but instead of blast, you bless. If you've been treated horribly, but instead of protesting, you pray. When someone takes something from you unjustly, if you've taken on this new creation dynamic, this new creation heart, this habitual stance of kindness and love, so then what you do is instead of demanding restitution, you release even more. That's when we look like Jesus. That's when we look like Jesus. Here's the question. Here's the question. Do we believe he was serious? He showed his seriousness by doing what he said. He didn't just talk a good game. He came and he walked it out. He gave his life when he never did anything wrong to anybody. If there's anyone who would have complaint for being treated unjustly, it's Jesus. Trust me, I love y'all, but I know y'all. Y'all earned a bunch of the stuff that's done to y'all. Even if not that particular thing, you did something else that you didn't get caught up for. But Jesus ain't never do nothing to nobody but love. And they still killed him. And he did it out of kindness and love anyway. That's the model. So if you've never accepted the truth of the gospel, now's the time. Now, right now, 
I, this isn't a hallelujah message, but the fact is that we have no better example that we should follow Jesus, but for the fact that he died for you. The Bible says in Romans, while we were sinners, while we were in our sin, while we are still wallowing in our own mess, Christ died for us. He gave his life while we had nothing in return to give him. He died for us anyway. So that's, that's, that's worth giving my life for. I have, there's nothing else worth living for than someone who would do that when there was nothing I could give him otherwise. So if that's you, if you've never accepted the truth of the gospel, then right where you are right now, all you got to do is say, I believe, I believe Lord Jesus. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you came and lived on this earth, lived a sinless life and was murdered on the cross for my sin. You paid a debt that I could not pay. I cannot pay. I can't pay you back. I can't even approximate giving you back what it is that you've given me. But what I can do is give you the little bit that I do have. I give you my life. Holy Spirit, come and live on the inside of me. Make me new. Make me new and help me to walk out this new creation, this new humanity reality. Thank you so much for saving me today. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to live for you for the rest of my life. I love you. I love you. I love you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for showing me what kindness really looks like. I love you. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, there's a, call, a code on the back of the seat in front of you, or a card there. Please fill that out. Let us know um, what it is you've done. We get to walk this discipleship thing out together. Here's the cool thing. I said this in the earlier service. One of the coolest parts about being the body of Christ is that we get the opportunity. We get the privilege. I'm, I'm not the church by myself. I'm the church in conjunction with you. We are all a part of the body. I'm basically just a pinky toe. But I get to be in relationship with arms and legs and hands and feet. The whole foot, like the good part, not the pinky toe part. I'm like the crusty toe on the pinky toe. But like, but we get to be, we get to be the body together. And so what we get to do is this, this, this new creation dynamic, this new humanity, the, the heart of a disciple that Jesus expects from us, we get to help one another. Live that out. We get to hold each other, ooh, dirty word, accountable. Because I'm not the church alone. Y'all, we're the church together. And then my brother's here from his church, that church, they come together and we're, we're all the universal church. We're the church. We're the body of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. So let's hold one another up. One of the ways we can do that, especially when stuff is going on, talking to the church right now. Some of y'all, stop talking. Show the world we're disciples by the love we have for one another.